So welcome everybody. Um, this is the second lecture of Franklin Hollander's course on metastability. Um, just a reminder that the third lecture will take place on Thursday uh, using the same link. Um, so just as yesterday, there'll be approximately two 30 minute tabs and in between we'll have an opportunity uh, to ask questions. Um, you should feel free to use the chat um, to ask questions, answer questions. Um, and again, Elena Poverenti is here and she'll be able to assist in answering questions in real time on the chat. Uh, a reminder that uh, this lecture is being recorded and being live streamed on uh, YouTube and through BERS. And so if you do not want to be seen or heard on the recording, you should uh, keep your audio and video uh, off during that period. Uh, at the end, we'll stop recording and there'll be an opportunity to uh, ask Frank uh, further questions. Um, just a reminder that um, the Zulip uh, uh, platform is there for discussions about the course and the exercises after. There were some updated um, exercises and lecture slides, which I posted on Zulip uh, this morning. And Sarai has uh, posted uh, the slides for today's lectures and the exercises on the chat. So you can, if you haven't got them and want to download them, you can. Um, okay, um, Frank's uh, second lecture on metastability will focus on Kawasaki dynamics. And so Frank, I'll turn it over to you if you yep. share your slides. I will uh, share my screen with you now and I'll open my file in full screen mode. Okay, everything visible? It is. Yes. Okay. Okay, <clears throat> so welcome back everybody. Uh, yesterday, uh, Aiden and I gave you a quick panorama of the area of metastability for interacting particle systems. And we started talking a bit about uh, background, motivation, and a bit of history. And then we started to talk about mathematical setting, which involved uh, a configuration space, a Hamiltonian, a reference measure, and these three things together built uh, an equilibrium measure that describes the system in equilibrium. And then we supplemented that with a Markovian dynamics, again, in very general terms, not specifying any details yet, that captures the non-equilibrium behavior that lies at the heart of, uh, of metastability, because metastability is a non-equilibrium behavior. It's about transitions between phases. And a very key thing was a formula that links the metastable crossover times that we're interested in to some basic tools from potential theory, predominantly harmonic functions and capacities. And uh, I tried to explain that this is, uh, that they play a major role when you really want to compute things about metastability. And, um, and Leinen and I also recalled two complementary variational principles for capacity, the Dirichlet principle and the Thomson principle that turn out to be very powerful computational tools. And I was trying to explain why these tools are there and how we can use them in order to really get our hands at the key uh, metastability uh, quantities. But yesterday, everything was sort of quite general. I didn't talk about any specific models. And it is now time to become more concrete and to see how these tools and these ideas and these principles can be used uh, and, and can be made to work in, in specific settings. And that's what this lecture and, and the next two lectures are going to be about. <clears throat> so today, we're going to focus on Kawasaki dynamics on lattices. And in particular, we're going to think of a large finite block in either the square lattice or the cubic lattice. And we're going to imagine particles hopping on the vertices of those lattices. And uh, they have some sort of attractive interaction that you will see uh, later on that makes them want to glue together to form a droplet and to condense into a, into a limit, into a liquid, sorry. And we will be addressing the question today, how 
uh, do the particles actually form a droplet uh, on their way from being, you know, single uh, dilute particles uh, representing a gas to a really filled uh, lattice, uh, which we think of as a liquid. And we're going to ask questions like, how long does it take uh, the particles to do so? And what are the re uh, relevant parameters in your model that correspond to the, uh, to the behavior of, uh, of metastability? So that is what we are going to talk about today. So, um, uh, sorry about that. Yeah, so we're going to, uh, so the target for this lecture is to analyze metastable behavior for a lattice gas. And we're going to um, make this uh, lattice gas uh, evolve according to what is called Kawasaki dynamics. And I will explain this, uh, do I, I will define it as we go along. And in simple words, what we will be dealing with is particles living in a finite box. These particles can hop around between nearest neighbor sites. So that's the motion. They will feel an attractive interaction when they sit next to each other. So they like to sit next to each other. There's a, there's a kind of van der Waals attractive uh, force. And we're going to imagine that these particles can be created and annihilated at the boundary of the box. And we're doing that because we want to think of this box as actually living in some big gas reservoir. And so when particles enter the box from the gas reservoir, we are going to think of them as being created and when they leave as being annihilated. And we do that in order to bring the problem down to a finite problem that's nicer mathematically to deal with rather than having to be involved with this entire infinite gas reservoir. So one, one can do these things too, but that's not what we're going to talk about today. And the question will be, uh, how does the uh, system nucleate? So if I start from an empty box, how long is it going to take before the box is completely full? And what is the system uh, going to do in order to make that happen? So I've listed here uh, uh, five names of people who have been deeply involved in understanding uh, and working on, on Kawasaki dynamics and uh, Enzo Olivieri and Elisabetta uh, Elisabeth Scopola from Rome started with this. They were the first to really look at this in detail and, and, then, um, and then Anton Bovier and Francesca Nardi and I sort of joined later and, and it became a, a really nice adventure with lots of uh, interesting mathematics going on. And we have been thinking and working on these problems and ver versions of this in the past, uh, uh, well, couple of years. Now, Kawasaki dynamics is a dynamics in which particles hop around. And this means that uh, because particles are conserved when they are inside the box, they, as I said, they can be created and annihilated at the boundary of the box, but inside the box they're conserved. It means that we're dealing with a conservative dynamics. And conservative dynamics typically in statistical physics are a bit harder to deal with than non-conservative dynamics. For instance, if you have easing spins flipping up and down, there's no conservation of the number of plus spins or minus spins, but for particles there is. And that usually causes some non-locality in the problem. And that non-locality will turn out to be really interesting here. In particular, when you want to grow or shrink a, a droplet of these particles, uh, you know, gluing together because of their attractive interaction, uh, particles must arrive from the boundary to the droplet, or they must go from the droplet back to the boundary. And so there's a non-locality, which, uh, uh, as we will see, makes the problem challenging and interesting at the same time. In particular, we will see that uh, when this uh, gas is building a critical droplet, and from the first lecture you know that there is something like a critical droplet that is the threshold for, for nucleation, then it turns out that this droplet can have all sorts of interesting motions of particles around the border. And that will turn out to lead to a shape of the critical droplet that is more complicated. And so we will have to get into issues of geometry of the critical droplet as we go along. 
Okay, so that is the setting that we're in. And now I come to specifying what exactly the model is that we're going to talk about. And there are four ingredients to defining Kawasaki on this finite box with what we would call an open boundary where particles can, can uh, appear and disappear. So we're going to start in two dimensions. At the end of the lecture, I will also tell you what we know when you want to do this in three dimensions. And we're going to start by imagining a large square box uh, centered at the origin and which we call lambda. And we're going to think of delta minus lambda as the interior boundary of this box. There is no exterior boundary of the box because uh, that, that, that is where the gas reservoir would be, but we only think of a finite box. And there, this boundary is special. Now, if we want to describe uh, a lattice gas configuration, then we have a configuration space that in our case now would be 0, 0,1 to the power lambda, where zero means the vertex is, uh, is, occupied, is, is empty, and a one would mean uh, the vertex is occupied by a particle. So uh, this describes all possible arrangements of uh, particles in your finite box lambda and eta is a collection of values eta x where x runs over this box uh, lambda and that is our configuration space right so here's a picture of such a lattice gas configuration and uh, here you would see that uh, the ones me uh, indicate the location of the particles and the zeros uh, the the vacancies or the holes and you see that there can be only one particle at a time. So there's exclusion. Two particles cannot sit on top of each other. And the boundary of this box, the internal boundary is important because that's where particles can actually uh, disappear or reappear. But once they are in the interior, they can only move around. And I'm going to specify that um, in a second. So having defined our configuration space, we need to define our Hamiltonian. So uh, this is a function that to every uh, configuration associates an energy. And we're going to write down the lattice gas Hamiltonian. And the lattice gas Hamiltonian is written up here and it consists of two terms. There is a term that uh, captures the interaction between neighboring particles. So if two particles uh, are at vertices X and Y that are neighbors of each other, and they're both occupied, so there's both, uh, they're both one, then they have an attractive, they have a binding energy minus U, and this uh, energy is negative. So uh, there is a kind of glue between particles in the sense that when they're next to each other, that then the, the energy of the configuration is lower. And I do this for every pair of neighboring particles. So this is the attractive part of the Hamiltonian. And then there is a part that um, is coming from an activation energy. I need to give every particle in the box an activation energy. So every particle makes the energy increase by a parameter delta. And this is necessary in order to represent the effect of the reservoir. Uh, I imagine that I have a gas and I look in a certain window and that would be uh, my, my box that I want to look at. And the outside reservoir I have removed and I've said I'm going to replace you by a condition that says you need some, some, uh, some energy to bring a particle into this box. So this delta essentially is a, par a parameter that controls the density of particles inside my box. And so this is a classical lattice gas Hamiltonian with an attractive interaction and an activity part, sometimes it's called chemical activity, um, in order to, to be able to control the density uh, of particles in your box. So there are two very important part, uh, parameters in this model u and delta, and we will play with them as we go along. They're very important. 
Now, we need to next talk about uh, dynamics. We need to say, okay, uh, these particles are going to evolve. What are we going to allow? Well, as I already indicated before, we are going to allow particles to hop. So a particle can hop uh, from one side to a neighboring side. So that essentially means that between these two neighboring sides, a zero and a one are going to be interchanged. That respects, that uh, captures the hop hopping. And there is this special role of the boundary uh, saying that at the boundary, so in the internal boundary of my box, particles can be created or annihilated. That, that would mean that a zero can turn into a one and a one can turn into a zero. So going back to this picture, inside the box, the ones can only move around and they can also move to the boundary. But in the, on the boundary, there's the initial, the additional phenomenon that a zero can turn into a one and a one can turn into a zero, which we would associate with thinking that the particle has entered or left the box, mimicking the effect of a gas reservoir, which we do not have, but we mimic it by this boundary condition. And now having specified what possible moves are allowed at all, we have to say with what rate these moves are going to happen. And Kawasaki dynamics is nothing other than a metropolis dynamics uh, based on the Hamiltonian function that we have defined at an inverse temperature beta. So that means that you go from a configuration eta to eta prime when uh, in order to do so you respect uh, the two allowed moves and you do that at the rate that is e to the minus beta times the positive part of the energy that you would get after the transition and the energy that you have at the moment. So this is the standard metropolis analysis uh, dynamics that you get once you have specified a Hamiltonian and it has an inverse temperature beta uh, in, um, uh, as a key parameter. And again, we may think of the outside of a box really as an infinite reservoir, which has all been replaced by a particular boundary condition. Um, and uh, we can think of e to the minus beta uh, delta as the density of the particles inside the box. So the D delta, uh, capital delta, controls the density of the particles in the box. Right, so we can play with that particle as a control parameter. Right, so for instance, you see that the moment you want to make a particle enter, uh, that will raise your energy by delta, and that will only happen at uh, a rate e to the minus beta delta, and that's why e to the minus beta delta is essentially the density of particles in the box. Okay. Now we're going to look at this problem uh, in a certain regime. And this regime uh, will be a regime of low temperature. So beta goes to infinity. So it means all upward uh, energy moves are costly and, and are very difficult to do. And all downward moves are, are for free because they occur with rate one. So climbing in energy is something that is difficult for the system and that is typical for a, a low temperature description. And we're going to pick our activity parameter delta in between u and 2u. And we will have to see why that is an interesting choice. And it turns out that this parameter choice, u can be any positive number you like, but as soon as the delta is between u and 2u, it turns out that you are in a metastable regime. It turns out, and we will have to see why that is true, that your, your gas is sort of super saturated. It likes to condense because, um, because uh, the, uh, it, you know, if it, if it creates a big uh, liquid, then it will really lower its energy because delta is less than 2u, but it's also not terribly supersaturated so that 
one would not have a situation where particles would come in the box very rapidly and, and sort of immediately condense because that would not be a metastable situation. That is certainly a, a physically uh, reasonable situation, but it doesn't correspond to, to metastability. So we will have to see why that regime really makes uh, sense and why that is interesting. So it's a regime where, yes, the condensation will happen, but it will be difficult for the system to do. And it turns out that there is a certain integer, uh, which we call LC, and which is the upper integer part of the quotient of U divided by 2U minus delta, that will play the role of what we will see and what we will call the critical droplet size. And I'll, I'll have a lot to explain to you where this comes from, but I wanted to mention it immediately here. And the fact that we pick delta between u and 2u means that this number is not one and it's not infinity. It's some number between two and infinity. So we're talking about some interesting length that is not infinity and that's also not the length of a single particle. Okay, so we will see where that comes from. Now, there is a little non-degeneracy assumption that we have to assume. I, we would like this quotient not to be an integer itself so that when you take the upper integer part, you really move a little up. And this is to, in order to avoid certain degeneracies and, and, and ties in the computation that are, 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 are would, would sort of unnecessarily complicate, it, complicate the computation, but wouldn't really contribute anything interesting. Okay, now uh, I'd like to start by giving you a little bit of a feeling where this number LC comes from. And it is also going to be our first steps towards understanding what really is the threshold in the system, in the model that we've been describing, uh, that prevents these particles to just come in and, and nucleate immediately. And the way we're going to get our hands at that is in two different ways. One is a static computation and one is a dynamic computation. And I want to explain both uh, of them to you now to, to give you a feeling for that. So what I would do is to say, suppose I would take, uh, I would like to take an L by L droplet. So in this picture here, it would mean a, an L by L uh, square filled with ones and, and all the rest zeros. So if I would ask myself, what would be the energy of such a configuration? Well, uh, that would be easy because you say in an L by L squared, there are L squared particles, each gets an activity um, uh, uh, delta. So there would be a contribution plus delta L squared to the energy of such an L by L droplet. Now, however, in that droplet, there are lots of particles sitting next to each other. And if you count how many pairs of particles sit next to each other in an L by L droplet, then that's exactly 2L times L minus one. So those are the number of uh, faces at which these L squared particles touch. So the gluing energy will be minus U times that number. So this is the energy of an L by L droplet of ones inside this box and the rest zero. And if I plot this as a function of L, it is a parabola that starts at zero, then goes up, reaches a maximum at the value u times, u divided by two u minus delta, and then goes down and actually uh, goes down uh, and becomes very negative because of the, the fact that delta is between u and two u. And, and so this is sort of telling us that the hardest droplet to create is the droplet with the highest energy because the metropolis dynamics has trouble moving up. 
And therefore, uh, a droplet of size u over two minus u squared should be something like a critical droplet. That should be something like the barrier. However, we agreed that this number would not be an integer. So LC is just the first integer on top of that. And the reason why we do that is to avoid non-degeneracy. And so the, the, the LC is just to the right here. And it, it's essentially telling us that every, if I take an LC minus one ti times L minus LC minus one droplet, it's still going to be subcritical. It will be before the, the, the tip. And an LC times LC droplet will be just beyond the tip and would therefore be called supercritical. So by this very simple computation, just looking at some energy computations and sort of thinking that probably the lowest energy that you can get is by forming uh, some, some quadratic droplet. We will have to talk about that later. You see that this number LC plays a key role because it is the size of the, the, the square that you need to conquer in order to fill your box. Because L is equal to zero would correspond to an empty box. And, and uh, well, a box, a very large box would correspond to a very large L. And then uh, you would have a very uh, negative uh, value and you would be very supercritical. So there is something about this LC that seems to be right. But this is only a static computation. I haven't done anything fancy yet, but, but we're on our track to beginning to understand what a critical droplet should be. Okay, well, I can, I can sort of discover this same critical uh, barrier also when I start to think a little bit of the dynamics. And so let me again do an argument that should convince you that this LC is, is, a, is a really important object by saying, let me take some kind of droplet of size L and let me try to grow uh, on the side of this droplet a bunch, you know, a whole bar of particles. Suppose I want to, ha I have an L by L droplet and I want to add a bar to this droplet. I want to grow it by a bar. What happens? Well, when you make a particle enter the box and your energy goes up by delta, when the particle glues itself to the boundary uh, of, of the, this droplet, you go down by uh, minus u. Then you need to bring in the next particle. You go up in energy by delta. And then you glue that next to the particle that you had. So this would be uh, a protuberance and you add it there and you go down by two U and you continue doing that. Each time you bring in a particle, you go up by Delta and each time you tuck it in the corner uh, to the uh, next to the previous uh, particles that you attached on, you go by, down by two U. And when you're done, you will have added a bar to your droplet. So this one is this one where I've been adding a bar. And if you look at this picture, then the highest energy is this particular uh, droplet here. And it is an energy two delta minus u higher than what I started out from. And if, so this is the barrier that you have to uh, overcome when you want to grow a bar. If I read this whole story backwards, and I say, well, how much do I have to go from here to there in order if I would remove this bar? Because if I remove it, all the arrows turn around. Then if you look at uh, what is happening, then you, you have that energy here. So there is a cost for growing a bar of length L, and there is a cost for removing a bar of L. And lo and behold, those two will become equal exactly when L is again U over two U minus Delta. So also in the mechanism of what it costs or takes to add or remove a bar, you see this thing, um, this number again coming back. 
And again, we have decided to take as a to assume that this is not uh, an integer, so that LC is the upper integer part, so that these things are cannot never form a perfect tie uh, in order to make things a little bit easier. So with that, I have explained both in a static and in a little bit of a dynamic way why this critical uh, length, this critical droplet size LC is so important because it really represents the size of a droplet that is the hardest to create, that is the barrier between having an empty box and having a full box. And my last slide for the break is this slide here in which I'm announcing what we're going to try and do with this information. We're going to think of starting the system off with an empty box. There are no gas particles around. We think of this as you know, a gas situation. It's very, very dilute. Then you will see that particles start to come in a particle comes in alone, probably it leaves the box before anything else happens. And if I wait for a very long time, I will see, oops, there are two particles in the box. Maybe they go and sit next to each other. Maybe they dissociate again and leave the box. And if you wait long enough, it will happen sooner or later that you create a critical droplet. And once you have done that, uh, you, uh, you will see that the system energetically goes over the hill and that this critical droplet will grow and grow and grow and eventually will fill all of the box. And when all of the box is filled, we say, bingo, uh, nucleation has happened and I have a liquid. So that is the kind of thing that we're trying to do. And I will have to go uh, after the short break into details about what exactly this critical droplet is. And there will be uh, things going on that we call protocritical droplets, so droplets that are almost critical. There will be canonical versions of those, non-canonical versions of those. There will be motion of, border, of uh, particles around the border of the droplet. And I will have to go deeper into the geometry of this critical droplet. We know that it is something like an LC by LC uh, particle, but well, roughly, and I will have to explain that. And then when you go over the hill, you, uh, you have uh, your nucleation. And we will have to come to grips with what exactly this critical droplet is, and there's a story to tell, and how long does it take for the system to create this critical droplet, because that will be the most difficult thing to do and the time it takes to create that critical droplet will really be the nucleation time and and uh, and a few more properties around that so that's what i'm going to uh, zoom in then after uh, after the break so have a let's have a small break okay frank there's uh one question from jens uh yep. asking for confirmation of his understanding of um these particles um, visiting all these prototypical uh, states. Uh, yeah. He asks, he says, well, if LC is not an, integer, an integer, we never quite reach a stable state unless we keep changing along the boundary. Is that uh, what LC is an integer? No, uh, LC is an integer. So, uh, so it means that an LC. I think he. I think he meant u minus. You know that. Yeah. The, the fact yeah. that you had to move slightly away from that uh, yeah. critical energy. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I did that in order to avoid ties. Uh, it, it's yeah. like uh, you, uh, you know, it's, it, it's some kind of arithmetic uh, uh, non-degeneracy that you want to do. And, and I will go much more deeper into what, what is this a protocritical droplet and what does it look like and, and, and what is this motion along the border? Exactly. And yeah. uh, okay. Yeah. There's a question from Tommaso. Um, he's asking about the density of particles within lambda is kept fixed. Um, is then the case that when a particle is created automatically, one is erasing uh, along the boundary? Uh, 
No, I, I do allow uh, particles to enter and that doesn't mean that another particle has to go away. When I said the density is e to the minus beta delta, it means uh, the, the average. Uh, so it means if I look at a vertex, uh, then the probability that there will be a particle there will be in equilibrium e to the minus beta delta. But I'm starting from a non-empty box. This box has to fill up, uh, nucleate, and then uh, it's completely full. Um, but in, uh, you know, this, this e to the minus delta is basically the density of, of the reservoir that I imagine around myself. If I would have a reservoir of density e to the minus beta delta, it would shoot particles into the box in a way that is very similar to what my boundary is now doing. I've, I, I, I'm living on a finite box. There is no outside world because it's much nicer to work on a finite box. But the effect of this delta is as if I would have a density reservoir that has that density e to the minus beta delta. OK? OK, I think maybe that there are more questions, but I suggest we, we take an honest to God three, four minute break, and then we'll come back and deal with the questions that are here, if that's OK. Yeah. Okay, very good. Okay, so there's um, several questions here. Yeah. So okay. in, in no particular order, Francesco is asking, if you have more than one species of particle, could metastability caused, uh, be caused from repulsion between the different states, different species? Uh, interesting question. Um, it is possible to deal with more than one particle. I had a PhD student, Alessio Troiani, who looked at that case, sort of black uh, and, and white particles. And uh, depending on the, uh, th then there's a U1 and a U2, and th there could be a delta one and a delta two, and uh, the, the 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 possibilities become uh, very rich. You can have things like checkerboards and 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 various things. Uh, so yes, we can do that, but it also becomes uh, geometrically much much harder. And you can allow repulsion and, and attraction, but you have to have enough attraction so that the system really wants to nucleate. Otherwise, you're not in a metastable regime. See, Roman uh, had a question about the sort of separation of the, the energy increase when a particle enters the box and the decrease when it attaches. He says, I have yeah. difficulty with the delta and the computation because if the particles are already there, I don't need to grow the energy by delta. Well, just glue it. yeah. Well, you 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 pay you pay the delta when you get in, and then when the particle moves uh, towards uh, from the boundary to this box, nothing happens. So so when I say this, it's mean it really enters at the boundary, and then any of the traveling towards the box, it doesn't do anything. I haven't indicated here. It's a good question, and then you go down only by you when you really attach it. And you need to do that if you want to grow uh, a boundary. So I'm not looking at what here in this picture at what uh, the particle is doing when it's already in the box and travels uh, 
to the boundary of the of this thing. I'm only looking at the moments when something really happens in the energy landscape. And uh, Mark Holmes, by the way, can people unmute themselves, Sarah? Press. Because if they want to ask directly, then Mark is asking about um, the, the growing and shrinking squares. Um, and he's yes. asking about a shape theorem for a square. Yeah, uh, we will see that because we're in a low temperature setting, uh, droplets always want to be as close uh, as possible to, to a quasi square. And this comes from a discrete isoparametric inequality. Uh, discrete isoparametric parametric inequalities are not easy. They're, they're actually harder than, than, the, than the usual continuous ones that we know about a sphere with maximal you know, volume and minimal surface and stuff like that. Uh, but this plays an important role. And especially when the temperature is very low, uh, it's very hard to climb an energy. And the system tries to do this in, in you know, the easiest way possible. And that's why this uh, dynamics has a tendency of want to uh, grow droplets in the form of squares, quasi squares, where you are adding a bar and adding another bar, because otherwise it's uh, energetically too costly. But that's a key point in uh, in the later analysis. So you, you may have indirectly just dealt with this. Shenji Yang was was asking why square, why not rectangle? Because they look like they're yeah. locally minima too. Yeah, they are locally minima, but but uh, globally not. It's much better if you have a very elongated square. Uh, if you would sort of break it off and and put it into uh, in a more square like you get a lower energy because you have much more, you don't change the number of particles, but you, 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 uh, you benefit more from the gluing. Um, but these are delicate uh, issues. It's not uh, immediately obvious and it's hidden in the isoparametric inequalities. Okay. Yeah, Roman had a follow-up. Uh, I should have picked this up earlier. He, he was saying in his view, you may have a lot of particles already in the box. It's not sort yeah. of one at a time. Uh, yes, it's very hard to create them because every particle that you bring in the box makes the energy go up. Um, but yeah, and in principle, you could say, well, I have three or four particles floating mm -hmm. around independently. One of the things that you will have to show is that the system doesn't want to do that. It doesn't want to create, create six droplets. It wants to, it's, it's so hard to create droplets that uh, the, 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 the easiest thing it can do is create one droplet and grow this layer by layer. And that's what is actually happening. Okay, um, so shall I move on? Um, maybe, we didn't deal with everything. Um, I'm gonna okay. try to answer some of these uh, privately. Okay. Okay. So why don't you okay, but there, there's also time after the second At part, the I'll be happy that's right. to, uh, to continue that. Okay. Yeah. So we now need to go a bit more into detail about what this critical droplet is, because that will be crucial for the fine analysis that I'm about to present to you. And uh, we already know that somehow this critical droplet is a bit like, uh, it's somewhere in between an LC by LC droplet and an LC minus one by LC minus one droplet. So what exactly is it? And this turns out to be an interesting Thing. So we're thinking about two configurations, the empty box and the full box, and they represent for us the gas where there's nothing and, and the liquid where everything is filled. And the metabolic stable regime is such that it's hard for part, it's hard to go from the empty to the full box, but the full box uh, is really the, the lowest in energy, as we already saw from this parabola uh, cal cal computation. And we're asking ourselves, what is the settle point between these two configurations? What is the lowest set of configurations that with your allowed moves, you have to move through in order to go from empty to full? And I'm going to give a description. The description is uh, requires a bit of attention because there's something interesting happening here with Kabat-Sarki dynamics that has to do with motion 
of particles around the border of the droplet. And this is an interesting thing, and it also provides us with, uh, with a level of richness and mathematical challenge that is nice. I'm first going to talk about uh, basic protocritical droplets. Protocritical means I'm almost critical. I'm still waiting for one particle to arrive from the boundary of the box, and I'm over the hill. And there are certain nice protocritical droplets. Uh, one is an LC minus one times LC quasi square with a single protuberance attached to the longer side. And there's also a version where this protuberance is attached to one of the shortest sides. So either the side of length LC or the side of length LC minus one. And here's a picture of an example of a simple protocritical droplet, which we call canonical protocol critical droplet. And this shape is one of the shapes that is lying on the boundary between uh, this empty, on, on the saddle point uh, between the empty and the full set. And one of the exercises that uh, Elin and I have prepared is for you to do that computation and, and argue that this is a droplet that for its volume has its, uh, has its smallest, uh, has the smallest, uh, uh, lowest energy given uh, the volume that it is uh, given here. I mean, if I want to fill my box, all particle numbers will sooner or later have, I have to go through. I have to have one, two, three, four particles until I have filled my box. So I'm looking for shapes that for a given particle numbers have a, a lowest energy and there are discrete isoparametric inequalities, not difficult in two dimensions, but non-trivial in two dimensions that will tell you that this is one of the shapes that has the lowest energy given its volume. Now, what happens is that before the next particle comes in, uh, it's possible to have motion of particles around the, around the border of this droplet. This particle can start to move around, but it turns out that when this particle is close to the boundary here, the corner, it may allow other particles to sort of land on top of it. And it's possible that this protuberance facilitates the motion of particles on top to move around the corner uh, to the other side. And this is an interesting phenomenon. When you first see this, you say, oh, it's not possible. But actually, there are some pictures in the exercises that show you that this is possible. So it's, it's possible uh, that uh, particles start to move around the boundary of the box. And what happens is that since delta is larger than u, uh, all paths that uh, are such that you never exceed uh, your current configuration in energy by more than you will happen and will easily happen before your next particle comes from the boundary of the box. So this droplet starts to wobble around uh, through motion of particles around the border even before the next particle comes in and tries to attach it it's to itself. And in fact, um, what what happens is that um, what happens is that uh, this set D has a certain structure. I will talk about it uh, uh, in a second. And then once, uh, uh, so all these protocritical droplets play a role. And then at some point, uh, there's another free particle coming in and saying, "Yeah, here I am. I I I, I go to the." protocritical droplet and I attach myself and I begin an applause because I say to everybody, we have now gone over the hill, all of us together. And that is what, what is happening. And this set of protocritical droplets has a certain dumbbell shape. There are the simple ones that are quasi squares of size length LC minus one times LC plus a protuberance. And then there's a whole bunch of things that you can obtain by sliding particles around the boundary of the droplet. And uh, there is a set that one can describe and it's not easy. And I decided not to go into details here. And this is done in, in an exercise though, so, so that you can get a feeling for this 
uh, interesting phenomenon of motion of particles around the boundary of the droplet, which is possible because you can move, uh, you can make moves of cost u before the next particle uh, comes into the story. Okay, so there is a, there's a rich structure which we have under control. And so at this moment, we have, we are done with really understanding the geometry uh, behind our problem. There's an empty set. It has uh, a, a certain, uh, it, it, has, it, it has zero energy. And then there is the full set where the box is entirely full that would correspond to my liquid. And I've argued that for, for a very large beta, which is the regime that we're looking at, very low temperature, the barrier between these two is really given by a whole family of uh, critical droplets that are all lying on the settle point between uh, these two. And so here again, you see this paradigm picture where, where already when I showed this for the first time, I said, you this is very naive. These things have a structure. And indeed the critical droplets here, they have a structure. It's a whole set of droplets that you can describe uh, geometrically. And this is the barrier that the dynamics has to go over. So we have to ask ourselves, how costly is it to go up this amount of energy in order to go over the hill? And that is what we're going to state now in, in a theorem. And this, uh, uh, here comes the, the main theorem um, for, for this particular model. And it is built on the tools that I've been describing. This is uh, Dirichlet and Thomson principle and test functions and test flows and uh, isoperimetric inequalities and, and various stuff. And it says, um, after all the smoke has cleared up, the average time that it takes you to go from an empty box to a full box, so this is what I would call the average nucleation time, is of a very simple form apart from a prefactor that is uh, you know, tending to one, there is a constant here and there's an e to the beta times another constant. And this constant here, this gamma, is exactly the depth of the hill that you need to climb out of when you come from empty to full. So it's exactly the high difference between this one and that one. That is what, uh, what gamma is. And that is a computation that you can uh, easily perform. This energy is zero. This is the energy of the protocritical droplet plus the free particle that comes around with a flag and say, I'm here, I'm here, I'm, I'm helping you over the hill. And you can do a straight computation using the lattice gas Hamiltonian and you find this number exactly in terms of your parameter LC. So this number is completely explicitly calculable. And it is the solution of an isoperimetric inequality. It's a, it's a minimizer uh, consisting of the whole class of these protocritical droplets which have a rich structure. And then there is a prefactor uh, which you can, for which you can write down a variational principle uh, coming from the Dirichlet and the Thomson principle. And this factor is uh, for finite lambda not so easy. Uh, it is some uh, complicated number. However, if the box is very large, this number simplifies and it is scales like log lambda, the log time the volume divided by lambda. And if you multiply it with this factor, it will converge to a limit. So for a very large box, I know what this prefactor is. And this number one over L, L, NLC, NLC is, a, is given by this number here. And this is exactly counting the number of protocritical droplets that, uh, that uh, we have been talking about. And that is very reasonable because each of these protocritical droplets could be your gate to go from empty to full. And if I have twice as many gates to go through, my average crossing time should go down by a factor two. So the fact that 
this prefactor picks up something like one minus the cardinality of the number of gates that I have available is very uh, logical. And uh, if you go deeper into the geometry, this turns out to be given by a, a certain sum that is uh, explicit here. And there is a scaling factor that depends on the volume of the box. And this has something to do with capacities of simple random walk having to travel from the boundary to, to uh, you know, in the neighborhood of a, of a critical droplet. And that has a very nice uh, scaling. Um, and you see that since the critical droplet is, is, can appear more or less anywhere in the box, there is, there's a proportionality factor, one over lambda if I would bring it to the right. Um, uh, so there is a multiplicity here that you take into account and the logarithm is, has something to do with the fact that uh, two dimensions is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a critical dimension for, uh, for random walks. So the story here is, yes, we've been successful. Uh, we have a very precise description, including uh, an energy barrier and something that has to do with geometry of, of critical droplets and counting and, and stuff like that. And so it's a happy ending with a very sharp result that is as precise as, uh, as you may wish at this point. So, so that's a good uh, story. And there, uh, there is the geometry of the critical droplet uh, coming from isoparametric inequality. What is the, given a certain volume, the, 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 the droplet with the, 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 you know, the lowest energy. And what, if I want to climb from empty to full, what is the, the lowest uh, threshold? Well, there are many of them and we have captured them in a computation that uh, uh, goes into the deep geometry of the problem, uh, some of which is explained in the exercises. So this prefactor is usually not easy, but we have a good uh, thing here that is the, if the box is very large, uh, we have a very good description of this prefactor. Uh, so nucleation in a large box is now really well understood to, to, into a lot of uh, quantitative uh, detail. So I'd like to uh, have a few more slides in which I'm going to tell you something about what happens when you try to do this in three dimensions. So suppose you would say, well, uh, I would like you to take a large cubic box in Z3. And again, same story, uh, inner boundary of the box, uh, particles can, uh, can uh, be created and annihilated. Once they walk in the interior of the box, they need to be preserved. There's uh, an activation energy delta, there's a uh, an, an, uh, an interaction energy between neighboring particles of size uh, of strength uh, minus u, a binding energy. So I'm not changing the model. I'm not changing the dynamics. The only thing that I change is that I'm now living on a cubic box rather than a square box. And the question is very legitimate to say, could you deal with that too? Uh, what is going to happen? And it turns out that yes, you can deal with that too. And we will pretty much find the same result. There are, however, a few things that become a little bit more complicated in three dimensions, which I want to quickly point out. Two in particular, it turns out that there are two lengths that start to play a role. Uh, one is u over three u minus delta and the other is two u over three u minus delta. Remember that the critical length that we had in two dimensions was u over two u minus delta, upper integer part, but it's now two things that start to become interesting. And I don't want to go in, in, in too much detail here, but I do want to show you some of the richness that is here, but this is becoming a bit more complicated now. Uh, we will have Again, protocritical droplets. Uh, we will need now to solve an isoparametric inequality, a discrete isoparametric inequalities in dimension three, which is really difficult. There's a beautiful paper by Alonso and Serf in the late 90s uh, 
solving some of these issues. And it's, it's really combinatorically beautiful and challenging to do that. And in, in three dimensions, that is uh, not easy. And it turns out that uh, if I take the analog of, uh, of the critical droplet size in three dimensions, that would be called an MC, that again, something like an MC by MC by MC uh, cube is roughly the critical droplet, but it's a bit more complicated there. It, it, it can happen that on this cube, you actually attach a two-dimensional critical droplet on one of the faces. And then on one of the faces of that, you can stick a protuberance. I'm going to show you a lovely picture that, that uh, Francesca Nardi made a number of years ago. And so it turns out that there are actually two times two length scales playing a role, a two-dimensional length scale and a three-dimensional length scale. The three-dimensional length scale describes the size roughly of your cube and the two-dimensional length scale describe what a two-dimensional uh, critical droplet attached to one of the spaces should come. And there are certain delicate things about some parameter that could be either zero or one, depending on some arithmetic properties of these numbers, whether they're compatible or not. I, I don't want to go into the detail, but I wanted to show this to you to, to see that there is an, a, a richness coming up. And at the same time, uh, this can be dealt with. You can pin it down after a lot of thinking. So let me first show this picture. So this is what a, a critical droplet would look like. It's a, it's a, it's a quasi cube or uh, uh, that, it, 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 and then on top of that, there is a critical droplet that uh, as we saw it in two dimensions attached to it. And then here is this guy that comes from the boundary and, and, and wears the flag and say, I'm about to arrive and we're all going to go over the hill by the time this particle tucks itself into the corner here because then this thing will be so stable that the rest of the particles will rain on top of it. So you see here a three and a two, two dimensional structure in this thing. And this is all captured uh, in the description of a whole bunch or you know, a rich set of protocritical droplets. And again, the energy barrier that this object uh, represents is computable. It's not so simple anymore as before, and there are all these two lengths around. I don't expect you to be able to, to grasp this uh, you know, during this lecture, uh, but the message is you can do it, and there is a lot of richness, and there are, is now two uh, scales, a three-dimensional critical length and a, and a two-dimensional playing a role. So, and here's a beautiful picture of one of those critical droplets that uh, you that would represent the barrier between the nucleation uh, for the nucleation problem in dimension three. So I'm 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 going to uh, uh, finish now. I'm almost done. Uh, again, uh, we will have a result uh, of a very similar nature as we have in one dimension. The average nucleation time to go from empty to full to go from a gas to a liquid is apart from a negligible prefactor, again of the shape, a constant times e to the minus beta gamma. This is the barrier that you have to overcome. We wrote down a formula for this here. It's more complicated in three dimensions than in two dimensions, but it's all explicit and computable. And there is a prefactor that again is the solution of a variational formula. And this comes out of Again, uh, applying uh, capacity estimates and Dirichlet principles and Thomson principle. And it turns out that by the sheer complexity of discrete isoparametric inequalities in dimension three or higher, it is not uh, possible to really write down a, a simple formula for this object, not even when, uh, when the box is getting very big. We know that it's going to grow like one over the volume but uh, we only have bounds on this number. There's something intrinsically complicated in this prefactor, even though we can write down variational formulas for it. Um, right, so that uh, concludes uh, my uh, story here.
um, the take home message is yes, for Kawasaki dynamics in two and three dimensions, you can make things work. You can build the general theory. You in the end end up getting a very sharp estimate about the mean transition times. It comes through computations that involve capacities, which uh, some of which you will see in, um, in the exercises. And there's, there's a happy ending to the story in the sense that you can all make it work. And there's a beautiful uh, theory behind it. Uh, there's a, ge a geometric richness uh, uh, deeply linked to, uh, to two-dimensional and three-dimensional discrete isoparametric problems that you have to solve. Um, and that is mathematically nice. And it is, uh, and this manifests itself uh, in into all the parameters, this gamma and this uh, prefactor kappa, in order to describe it. So it's 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 really for Kawasaki dynamics, the you know the sharpest result that it, that that has been around, uh, uh, that that the sharpest result that uh, that is around and and not been improved uh, since that yet. So so it's a very successful comp computation based on nice mathematics and nice, uh, nice behavior. So thank you very much. So uh, Sarah will now unmute us. So we can uh, thank uh, Frank for a terrific lecture, uh, extremely clear and beautiful results. Thanks, Frank. Welcome.